All right, I hope you guys had enough time out there for that intermission. Um, Chuck, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to give some reference for those who don't know the kind of the story behind starting small. Um, my personal story really started from Chuck accepting to be my first guest. My screensaver on my phone is actually still my very first photo I, I have with Chuck. And okay, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it makes me remember kind of like the, the beginnings. And like in 2017, I sent an email. I don't know if Chuck remembers this. In high school, I was in high school um, going into my senior year, and I said, hello, Chuck. Uh, I'm a graduate or soon-to-be senior. I'm studying this. I'm in percussion. I said, what is the culture like at Sweetwater? And especially at that scale, I did not expect Chuck to respond, but he responded that night. From there, nothing happened. 2020, the idea of the podcast comes. And I'm thinking, who could be my first guest? I wanted to start it at some sort of scale so I can pitch that going forward to get some bigger guests. And I thought back to that email, and I screenshotted that email I sent to Chuck, and I sent it to him. And I pitched the idea of the podcast, and Chuck accepted to be the first guest. I went out to Sweetwater. And from there, I was able to, to kind of leverage that first interview and kind of roll over and get those other interviews excitingly expedited and quickly because of your acceptance. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing. So I'd like to go back to Ohio. So born in Ohio, and then you do relocate to Fort Wayne. Kind of describe your family life. What were your parents like at that time as well? Can I get four espressos first? I can't <laughs> imagine starting the day with four espressos. Yeah. Maybe that's why Peter has so much energy. <laughs> Yeah, I was born in southern Ohio, uh, but going into seventh grade, my mom and dad moved back to Fort Wayne, where my mom was from, and I've considered Fort Wayne my home, been there the rest of my life. Yeah, amazing. During that time, I know some of your character was driven from Boy Scouts. You're really involved with that, and we'll get into it later, but Sweetwater has such an amazing philosophy of always doing the right thing. Can you describe how that has shaped your character, starting out in an early age, entrepreneurial endeavors, Boy Scouts, how that shaped your, pro your progress? Sure. I grew up in a, a broken home, not unlike many of us, and I have four younger brothers and sisters, and we all handled it in a different way. Uh, I chose to not allow it to determine my future or, or to have any control, frankly, over me. But I, I, I was very entrepreneurially driven. That wasn't a word we used back then. It wasn't even a word I think invented back then. Um, but I had lots of jobs early on, frankly, as a way to escape from my crazy home life. Um, I had a paper route where most of my friends had 40 customers. I had 330 customers. Uh, I had a, a, my very first business at age five and six was making pot holders. Uh, I would put the loops across the frame and go around the outside, and I sold those for 15 cents a piece, two for a quarter. And my little town of Waverly, Ohio, had 5,000 people, and I sold more than 10,000 pot holders to that town. Um, just, I was always driven, driven, driven. And scouts, same thing. I felt if it was worth doing anything, do it the best you can do. And so I had so many arrow points as a Cub Scout, they went off my shirt into my pants. And Boy Scouts really set me up, I think, for life. And the Boy Scout law says that a Boy Scout learns to be trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, clean, brave, and reverent. Amazing principles to live by personally. But I think they're also amazing principles to live your whole life and, of course, in business, too. And so that's what we've practiced for, for the next many, many years at Sweetwater and, frankly, all the companies that we have today. Mm -hmm. And I just firmly believe in those principles. And you can take any one of them, trustworthy, loyal, helpful. I won't go through the list again. You can Google it. Uh, but they're just amazing principles to live by. And that plus always, always doing the right thing has caused our businesses just to flourish. In fact, for 44 years, every wow. business I've owned has done better at the top line and the bottom line than the year before. It's incredible. So. Let's get into how music plays a role in your progress. Of course, you get into music business, but starting out, you are into saxophone. What sparked that interest and kind of describe your education life as a student progressing? Sure. Uh, I was in fifth grade, and back in those days, almost everybody uh, got to play a music instrument. I wanted to play trombone. My dad was an accordion player, and I think probably frustrated, frustrated from playing accordion. He says, you don't want to play trombone. They never get solos. <laughs> what's, what's a solo? That means nothing to me. And he says, you want to play saxophone. So we went to a pawn shop in Columbus, Ohio, bought a saxophone, and I went back home to Waverly, where I live, which is about an hour south, and I was so proud. I took it into the band director, and I put the mouthpiece on, and I played the first note, kind of honked some awful sound, and I thought I was doing great, and he says, you have the mouthpiece on upside down. So 
I had to pull the mouthpiece off and turn <laughs> it over. Um, you know, and I, uh, I really got into it deep, self-taught. I've never taken a music lesson uh, on saxophone or keyboards or flute or any other instruments that I play, um, but I learned really quick. And so I listened back in those days, long before the internet, you'd listen to records, you read lots of books, and I basically learned to play out of a book. And so through middle school and high school, uh, I took as much music as I could, but I also thought I wanted to be a doctor. I loved children, mm. wanted to be a pediatrician, so I took chemistry and Latin and all those sort of things. Yeah. And immediately after high school, I went on the road as a musician, played all over the country, almost all the continental U.S. states. Uh, back in those days, there were a lot of places where you could play six nights a week played a nightclub or a hotel or college circuit. And so you would play Monday through Saturday and then Sunday you'd travel to your next gig. And after doing that for almost five years and frankly having a lot of fun but not making much money, uh, I came home and figured, what am I gonna do? Uh, and by then I had gathered a little bit of equipment so I started a recording studio out of my beat up old VW bus. And that VW bus, my mom and dad had given me in high school. My mom had wrecked it into a telephone pole. So I filled it with two gallons of Bondo putty on the front I rebuilt the engine, and I spray-painted the bus with 99-cent cans of blue spray paint from Kmart. Wow. And that's what I drove to school, and that's what I drove on the road as a musician, and what wow. I came back home and started the recording studio with. Amazing. How did you end up pulling in those first recording artists? Who were they? Were they local artists? And what was it special about your rec recording studio that attracted them? I didn't say they were artists. They uh, yeah. were anybody that would pay me a few bucks to record them, and I really wasn't even in it for the money. I just enjoyed recording others. So I would yeah. pull the bus alongside the school, the nightclub, the church. I'd run 200 feet of microphone cables in, and then I would mic up the choir, the band, the preacher, the company president, whoever it was, and then I'd sit mm. in the bus with my headphones and record them back in those days on analog reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Wow. And then I would take those recordings to the living room of my very modest 12 by 55 mobile home, where I would edit those recordings together and make them into, a, in those days, a record. That's incredible. I'll, I'll let you take a, a drink, but uh, going into deeper into that recording, I know you get into specializing in your recording studio. You reverse engineer a Kurzweil, which is a keyboard, and if you can kind of explain what that is, what made that so special, that evolution that you did with that. Sure. So uh, again, I was recording out of the VW bus. I did that for several years, and uh, that was from 1979 to about 83. And at that point, I graduated to, to a, a real recording studio, well, close to a real recording studio. <laughs> I added on to a house that I had purchased, a small 1,000 square foot house. I put a, a two-car garage on, and now I was a recording studio where people could come to see me versus me going to see them. And uh, I had a friend that invited me to the music dealer show called the NAM show, National Association of Music Merchants. It, those days it used to be up in Chicago. And I went and saw the show, but what really impressed me, uh, 1983, 84, was a music instrument called the Kurzweil K250. And it was invented by the futurist Ray Kurzweil and some uh, graduates from MIT. And it was the first music instrument that played back digital recordings or samples of other instruments. Now today, that's real easy. We do that on our iPads and iPhones and all that, but in the mid-80s, computer memory was so expensive, and the concept of recording uh, real instruments onto to basically the built-in memory chips was just unheard of, and this was the first at that. And it was a very expensive instrument. Uh, it was about $10,000, and you could add another fifteen dollars to $20,000 of options and upgrades for it. But anyway, I thought if I bought this Kurzweil, I could use it in my own recording studio, and I could tell my customers at the end of a recording session, um, would you like to hear it with a 45-piece string section or a 50-voice choir or an upright bass or even the nine-foot uh, Steinway grand piano that was built in? And it was a really very realistic-sounding instrument. So I bought the thing, and it did exactly what I wanted. Uh, I started making my recording sessions a little bit longer, therefore I made more money, but more importantly, my customers got a better product. And then I started taking it around to other recording studios in the Midwest, and they would hire me for the day to bring the keyboard in and add orchestrations and all the stuff that today sounds pretty simple, but it was unheard of back in the mid-'80s. Uh, and then through the process, I was always technical, and uh, I wrote a lot of software early on for running my recording studio, billing software, and software to make cassette labels for all the cassettes we used to make. But I reverse engineered how this Kurzweil worked, and it was a works in a drawer. You take three screws out, pull out the back of it, and uh, you could add additional sounds and that sort of thing. So I started making my own sounds, writing my own software for it and uh, started reaching out to other Kurzweil owners. And yeah. they were famous musicians like Stevie Wonder and Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton and Bob James and all these old guys and gals. And uh, <laughs> I say, I have a Kurzweil. I have these sounds I've made for it. Do you have sounds? Let's trade. So I started the, 
the Sweetwater Sampling Network to trade sounds with each other. I quickly figured out they were musicians first and they weren't really technical people like I was, so they were wanting my sounds and they started giving me album credits and on and on and on, but I didn't get many sounds from them. Uh, a couple years of doing that, then I started selling machines. These same people that were pretty famous and frankly had a few dollars were buying second and third and fourth machines. It got to the point that Kenny Rogers had 14 of these machines that he would carry on the road with him. He'd have six or eight of them on stage, a few of them on his bus, some in the green room, and it was a way for him to reproduce at that time the hits that he'd had for 30 and 40 years. Mm -hmm. Michael Kamen, a very famous film composer from Europe, had a home in Boston and in uh, Las Vegas, and he had 30 of these Kurzweil machines because they could duplicate the sounds of an orchestra at his fingertips. Wow. It was just an amazing thing. And what really changed my business after a few years of helping my friends with their Kurzweils and, and, and that sort of thing, I got a call one day and somebody asked me about doing uh, music software on the computer. And I said, yeah, I know how to do that. I'm already doing that in my studio. So I became a dealer for software uh, for the Macintosh computer mm -hmm. back in 1989, 88, that sort of period. Wow. I'd love to get into the transition of when does Sweetwater become a retailer then? So transitioning off, you're kind of you're selling the Kurzweil, Kurzweil's as your creation, but then you're retailing other products as well. So how does that work? Yeah, so I did Kurzweil in the last part of the 80s. And by 1990, I realized that I had five people operating out of my home lower level, people coming and going on all hours of the day. <laughs> We'd have Chick Corea's bus pull in front of my house, which really excited the neighbors, or Kenny Rogers' bus. They were never on it. It was always their road crew, managers, that sort of thing. And I finally decided enough was enough. I needed a real commercial location. Uh, so I moved a few doors down the road, bought 13 acres of land, built a small 5,000 square foot building, mm. moved in with uh, the five of us employees. Uh, the next year, we had 20 employees. We added another 10,000 square feet, and it kind of grew and grew. Mm. Uh, and you fast forward to today, we've moved to a new campus where we have 160 acres, uh, a million square feet under roof, 2,800 employees, which wow. I'm humbled every day. Yeah, certainly. In those early stages, I, I love the startup space. So when you are 80s, 90s, what are those first vital hires? Why are they those hires specifically, and what, what were they? That first hire is really hard because you always think you can do it better yourself and yeah. whoever you're going to hand it off to isn't going to do it as well. Of course, that also stifles your business because you can't do it all yourself. And one of the things I quickly learned, uh, I know a lot of things about a lot of, of different subjects, but I was not necessarily an expert in any of them. And so I made sure that I hired people that were better than me. And that's the real secret, to hire people you like, you like to be around, and make sure they really know their game really well. And uh, I've just always been really careful to hire great people and then get out of the way and let them do their thing. I try not to micromanage. I'm not really involved in the specific details because I trust them. Yeah. Going in from your home and then scaling. Where, where does that next facility open up? What's the size of that, the scale? How many employees do you have at that time when you decide to expand? Well, I started again humbly in, in this broken VW bus and, and uh, moved into this house on Getz Road where I had one uh, employee and that's all I had for a couple of years. And then mm. we moved to another location, that first real commercial location and, and got to five employees. Mm. And then 5 to 20 to 50 to 150. And we moved yeah. out of there after uh, about 17 years. And we moved out with about 230 employees. Wow. So Incredible. So to the audience, if you order an instrument online, it's very likely that it's coming from Sweetwater. In those early days, what were the products that you were selling? What, what brands did you acquire? How did you reach out to those brands and pitch your service? Yeah, in the early days, it was more technology-oriented. Oriented. Yeah. So it was basically the Kurzweil and, and software and then audio equipment. And frankly, we didn't sell guitars till about 20 years ago. Mm. And I kept having customers over and over going, I'm buying all this technology from you, but why can't I buy a guitar? You're making me go to your competitors. And I, yeah. I heard that enough times. And I finally thought about it. And, and I knew a lot of our employees were guitar players. And I only wanted to do guitars if we could do them different than everyone else. And so mm. came up with the idea of a guitar gallery where we quality control check every guitar that comes into us. We take really high resolution pictures and we put it online where you can see the difference in the wood grain. You can see the serial number and we just make sure that guitar is going to be really, really great out of the box. And so mm. we went from literally not selling guitars to last year we sold 350,000 guitars in one wow. year. Where That's do they true. go? 350,000 <laughs> guitars. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank Talk goodness a lot of guitar players buy lots yeah. of guitars. I, I oh, for like sure. Yeah. For sure. Talking on, I would love to get into the scale that Sweetwater is at today. How do you manage 
CEO for so many years, how do you manage a team at that scale? Starting so small, 1,500 employees plus, how do you manage that scale of a team? Yeah, I, uh, you know, it is pretty unusual for an entrepreneur to take a company to the level that I've been able to take it, uh, but it's surrounding myself with great people. Mm -hmm. Just always, always want to find great people. I can't tell you how many times uh, I didn't necessarily have a role, especially as we got bigger, yeah. but I would see the light bulb on with that person and I go, I want them to come work for us. We'll figure out what they're going to do later. I, I just think if you can surround yourself with great people, yeah. uh, you're just very fortunate. And that's how I did it. I just hired great people. Certainly. Going in back to kind of the philosophy with your Boy Scouts and how you were raised, I know when you go to Sweetwater, there's so many mottos plastered around. And the philosophy has remained like that since the, the business has started all the way to growth. Um, what impact has that had on your success? And what is the Sweetwater philosophy as well? Well, I think it's had everything to do with our success, but to always do the right thing, uh, those are really trite words, a little easy to say, mm -hmm. um, but it means that we, everyone is empowered, and I don't care whether you're answering the phones or you're working in shipping, we're only as good as our weakest link, and so every one of our employees knows they're empowered to do the right thing. If a receptionist uh, feels that they need to replace a keyboard for a customer, they can replace a keyboard. Uh, I may talk to them later or someone may talk to them and try to understand why and learn from it, but I will never ever chastise an employee for doing too much. I mm -hmm. will chastise an employee for doing too little or taking too long. At, at, our, company, you, at our company, you never have to ask for a manager. I, I think that's crazy. Uh, I just want the person that answers the phone to take care of the problem, mm -hmm. if there is a problem. Uh, and that has just turned us into having a great reputation around the country, around the world. Yeah, amazing. I would love to touch on the customer service part. The philosophy you remain, um, you have sales engineers who's actually designated towards each customer. If you go into the Sweetwater facility, you can see the logistics. It's so much going on. Products are getting shipped out from the warehouse. How do you manage inventory and keep the logistics smooth? And if a customer does notice something, how does that sales engineer, how does that step into place to handle from there? Well, it's all about uh, having great people again and then having great technology. Mm -hmm. I've always invested in technology. I think technology, especially today, is so inexpensive and so powerful for what it can do. And uh, I laugh when I go into companies and I watch them with you know, antiquated equipment or small screens. Man, I want to give all the power I can to my people. And so with our inventory as an example, I mean, everything we have is online down to the last screw. And when it comes in, we, you know, we receive it, we put it away, we know we have it, and it makes it real easy for the salespeople to know what we actually yeah. have in stock. You know, back to your first part of the question, our model is quite a bit different than all the other mail order places you might call. Uh, now, and we happen to sell music instruments, but I'm really more about the philosophy of helping our customers. And by that, I mean that the customer will always talk to the same salesperson, or we call them sales engineers. They have a four-year degree usually, not always, but usually, and then we bring them into Sweetwater and we train them for 13 weeks. We call Sweetwater University. About a third of it is learning how the products work, although that they kind of know by the time they get there. Another third of it is learning to work our information system. And the final third, and again, not necessarily in that order, but how to develop relationships with people. Because we're in the relationship, we're in the people business, we just happen to sell music mm -hmm. instruments. That being said, I've taken those same philosophies and put them into lots of other industries. Yeah. Uh, but our sales engineers work one-on-one -on -one with the end customer. So we keep track of who you are and your name and maybe your spouse's name, your dog's name, your children's name, birth date, what equipment you have. Uh, a little bit like Big Brother, but we yeah. kind of take the technology and we hide it from the customer. We don't call them by a number. Uh, it's always by their you know, name, first name, last name, whatever they would like to be called. And we track all that personal information. So when a new product comes out or an upgrade for their current product, we can take care of them. And we're thinking about the long-term repeat sort of business, not mm. just the one transaction. Certainly. Going into that, I feel like there's so much importance behind a healthy company culture. How, how do you keep employees satisfied to be able to react to customers who are either happy, sad, mad? How do you manage that culture and what is that Sweetwater culture like? We've always had a very strong culture. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have been involved in the business and every time a baby's born, we're buying welcome to this world baby gifts and with 2,800 employees, we're buying a lot of baby gifts. It's like many, many every week. Yeah. Um, we, we, we have events every month for our employees. Uh, I try to be Chuck. I'm not Mr. Surak. I walk the halls. I sit in meetings uh, with all the employees. Um, we, we buy turkeys every uh, Thanksgiving for our employees. We've done that forever. Of course, wow. we have holiday parties and uh, we do events at the zoo and, and ballpark in the summertime. We try and have some sort of an event for our employees every month. Yeah. Uh, we engage in the employees' lives. Uh, if they're not just a, an eight to five or whatever hours they work employee, I, I mean, I feel like I'm employing the whole family and so I really want to be engaged and know 
children and spouses and highlights and lowlights in their life and that sort of thing. Certainly. And all that adds up to culture. Yeah. That's become incredibly more important in just the last few years, you know, mm. post-COVID and, and Black Lives Matter and all that, but we've always been there, so that's pretty easy for us. Yeah. I, I think also the facility that you guys have, if you have ever seen Sweetwater, you, you go there, there's a full cafeteria, there's employee engagement activities going on, even they can get their hair cut there. Okay, what was the inspiration towards expanding into offering those offerings for employees specifically? I want to do for my employees what I would want to do for myself, and I want to treat them the way I would want to be treated. So yes, we have a beautiful, beautiful building, uh, very fortunate with that, but all kinds of concierge level services, you need your dog groomed or your car worked on or find a babysitter, we can help arrange that. Uh, mm. We have, as you said, a salon where we get haircuts and nails and massages. Uh, we have a full-time doctor and nurse, which wow. is completely free to our employees, wow. uh, for the employees and spouses and family members. Uh, we have a racquetball court. We have, I mean, uh, you call it a cafeteria. I mean, it's really high quality food. That yeah. We actually subsidize the price for our employees. Uh, a lot of benefits just goes on and on. Our theater has a big movie thing that we do several times mm. a month to bring kids and families in to watch movies on our big screen. Just a lot of fun stuff. That's incredible. Going into also the store aspect, customers are able to come to the facility. What was the reasoning behind opening an internal store into your facility where they can shop internally, but also online as most of your customers, of course? Sure. Well, we have about 9 million customers around the country, and most of our business is around the country. We do a little bit of international stuff, uh, but we really based on our relationships with our customers. It's, and, uh, it's important for us to be able to speak the same language beyond similar time zones and that sort of thing. And frankly, there's so much business in the US, we can't keep up with it. We mm. can't find enough sales engineers to grow our business. We have about 650 of our employees today, actually closer to 700, mm. our sales engineers. Um, but we have people coming to see us from all over the country and they will turn it into their vacation, their Mecca, come see the Mecca uh, from their point of view. And uh, we wanted to have a really nice store. And so we have have the largest music store in the country, if not in the world. Mm. Uh, it's about 55, 60,000 square feet. Plus it has 650,000 square feet of warehouse space that has yeah. all the instruments in there if we don't have it in the store. And we get hundreds of people literally every day coming from all over to see us. It's incredible. What part of the business is important be behind both selling, you also have an educational piece, so much digital presence, you host events. Why do you have that widespread? What does that do for your customer, ba customer base kind of bringing in together a family. Yeah, mean? the genesis of that goes way, way back. Even before the internet, I was sending out uh, dot matrix newsletters to my Kurzweil friends and telling them about new upgrades, new things, not to sell it, but really just to inform them. We put the very first website on from the music industry in 1994, and for several years, we didn't sell online. We just educated our customers. I yeah. just think it's the right thing to do. It does happen to turn into business, but it's not driven uh, it's not our drive for doing it. We just want to treat people the right way, and if it turns into business, that's great. Mm. I've never been worried, and I teach my employees just always do the right thing. And if you can sell a customer a product that's less expensive that'll do the job well for them, that's fine. That's the right thing to do for the customer. I'm not worried about making the most on the transaction. I mm. want to make sure that we do the right thing so over and over we'll get the referrals and the repeat business, that mm. sort of thing. Incredible. I know it all branches back to the customer service that you guys have, but how do you differentiate from competitors? I know we have a couple large retail chains that we would compare yourself to, but really you guys are a monopoly in instruments online pretty much. Well, I, I would never want to say anything disparagingly t about the competitors. There are about 8,000 music stores across the country, yeah. uh, a few large chains. I just like to say we do what we do really well, and, and they do some things well also. But uh, I think that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with the sales engineers is really important. He keeps track, or she keeps track, of what equipment you have, what your dreams, your desires, your aspirations are. Uh, I think having the guitar gallery so we know when that instrument goes out, it's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, a two-year warranty, you know, I, I think it's crazy that a manufacturer only gives a one-year warranty. If, if that's how little you believe in your product, I don't want to recommend it. I don't want to sell it. So mm -hmm. everything we sell has at least a two-year warranty, sometimes even more nowadays. Um, we just, if a customer has a problem, it's, you know, they, they may be wrong even, but they're always the mm -hmm. customer. And so I'll just do whatever it takes. I'll replace it. I'll, I'll apologize, you know, wh whatever it takes to do the right thing for mm -hmm. the customer. For sure. And I, I guess those things help differentiate us. And yeah. We call that the sweet water difference, yep. but that differentiates us from our competitors. Definitely. Going into the leadership team, I know some of your leadership directly under you, you would have for many years. I, they started with you. What did you look for uh, for someone joining the C-suite team or what kind of resembles a leader to you for Sweetwater? 
well, I don't care what level you are in the company. What yeah. I'm really interested in is do you have fire in your belly? Maybe not four drinks like Peter had this morning, but do you have yeah. fire in your belly? Uh, I want to see people where the light bulb was on, their eyes are bright, and um, I have been fortunate to, to have some really, really great people. Uh, my number two, three, and four folks have been with me 30 years. Mm. Uh, a couple of them have been 20 years. Um, again, it's a family, and so you don't leave your family very often. Yeah. So. Definitely. Going into, um, you departed Sweetwater just, re just recently, really. What um, was it looking for someone to take over your position? And I know that's probably difficult. You, you've grown this from just the VW bus. What was that transition like for, for you as so many years CEO? It's been good. It's been bad. It's all over the map. You know, I was very fortunate, again, with these great people. I was comfortable leaving the company in great hands, and it is. It's in great hands. Yeah. Um, it was just an opportunity a year and a half ago uh, to take some money off the table because I had invested every dollar we had into the company, mm -hmm. and I had been approached many times through the years, um, but I was fortunate. It's just the right time uh, in the fall of 21. Uh, right before the market kind of slowed down, uh, yeah. offered just an insane amount of money, which allowed us to do some other things in our community and help others, that sort of thing. Yeah, I love that portion of kind of your personal journey is so much give back. What um, inspired kind of the CRAC family of brands, which is something else, and then also the CRAC Foundation uh, from your department of Sweetwater? Well, we've always been very supportive of our community and, and people in need in our region uh, for decades at Sweetwater. We've always been one of the leaders in our community giving back. Uh, I just feel that we've been very, very blessed. We can't take it with us. Uh, mm. I, don't, I don't see U-Hauls at cemeteries very often. <laughs> and uh, I just thought it was important to help others in need. And, and so with the sale of Sweetwater, and I sold the majority of it, we still own a big piece. Um, I'm still the chairman of the board there, but I, I'm not involved in the day-in, day-out activities. But one of the things that allowed us to do is create a, a big foundation. And so yeah. we started this foundation, and it, it has several pillars that are really important to us in our community, which mental health and uh, people having needs and, and entrepreneurship and, and those sort of things are the mm. pillars that are really important to me. It's incredible. What does the CREC, not CREC, but the Sweetwater family of brands look like to you now? So you stepped away from Sweetwater Sound, but you also have Sweet Cars, Aviation. Yep. Kind of get into that with your management today. So I've got about 16 other companies that I'm still running. So I have close to the energy of Peter, not quite that much. But uh, <laughs> uh, again, great people running them. And so I don't have to be involved in the day in, yeah. day out. But uh, I've got a couple different aviation companies, a flight school, uh, helicopters, airplanes. I have an insurance company. Uh, we own a, a, a chain of optical stores in northeast Indiana. We have a, a big nightclub restaurant called the Clyde Theater where we prevent present big concerts and have lunch and dinner every day uh, with some coffee shops and I don't know, I'm probably forgetting some, but a whole bunch of others. Yeah, that's awesome. Internet company. And then last May, almost a year ago, I bought a bankrupt company out of northern Michigan that builds or manufactures helicopters. Mm. And so uh, we've got them back on the straight and narrow. We have 130 employees today. We had zero last May. Wow. And we just went to our helicopter trade show about a month ago and exhibited our first helicopter off the line, which was just wow. incredible for the morale of the employees. They, they had been in a bankrupt situation for several years, and yeah. I was able to turn it around and, and make them successful again. Wow. When you, when, you, when you took over there, how many employees was it? Zero. 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 Wow. Um, how did it scale in one year? What was it behind well, that? Well, a lot. it was a small town in the UP of Michigan, so it's on the, the west side of Lake Michigan, about an hour north of Green Bay. Yeah. A lot of those were employees that wanted to come back and did come back. I'd probably say 80% of them were employees yeah. that came back. And then others are folks that we found and hired around the area. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts behind why Fort Wayne. So you, you scaled all of your companies so far, really, in this region. Why is that? I would say, why not Fort Wayne? Yeah. Uh, Fort Wayne's a great place to live. All of Indiana is a great place to do business. Uh, but Fort Wayne specifically, it, it's a great community with a great quality of life. It's one of the few cities in the Midwest that's growing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got an amazing downtown that's happening. And uh, we've got all kinds of minor league sports, the oldest hockey league franchise in the whole country with the Fort Wayne Comets. Uh, we've got Matt Ants doing basketball. Uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, we had a new ballpark uh, made downtown. It became the number 
one minor league baseball park in the whole country. I think it's something like 12 out of the last 13 years. So there's lots and lots of great things. Parks, quality of life, crime mm -hmm. relatively low. And if that's not enough, we're two hours from Indianapolis, three hours from Chicago, three from Detroit, three from Columbus. So I'd say, yeah. well, why not Fort Wayne? Yeah, no, I love that. You know, in the old days, it was hard to get people to move to Fort Wayne. In fact, I was telling someone earlier, mm -hmm. when I was on the road as a musician, they'd ask where I was from, and I'd say Fort Wayne, and they'd go, in Texas. I go, no, it's Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> the only thing people ever knew in Indiana was the Indy 500. Uh, to, and in, in the early days, it was really hard to hire people and ask them to move to Fort Wayne. Today, yeah. it's flipped around completely, and yeah. people are f flying or fleeting from the, from the big cities pretty fast and yeah. looking at Midwest cities like, like Fort Wayne. Yeah. What does your day-to-day -day look like now? So you stepped down from Sweetwater about a year and a half ago. What, I know your schedule is so busy. I've, I've seen it before. What, what does that look like? <laughs> Uh, I start with four express, no. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I read a lot, you know, similar to Peter, I read a lot, so I get up early in the morning and I read several online newspapers and uh, I do the old guy Facebook thing to keep up with friends and family, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, get ready, go, I, start, I get breakfast either at home or on the way to school. I recently uh, gave up my duty, and for many years I've been driving my daughter to school, but uh, she just got her driver's license, oh, so wow. I've lost that responsibility. It was great quality time. Uh, sometimes, although most of the time, the last couple of years, she didn't want to talk to me on the way to school. Dad, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. She got her license about a month ago, and I happened to be at that helicopter show, so I, you know, you didn't get to see her first day of driving to school, but I, I yeah. called her at the end of the day. I said, honey, how was your first day of driving to school? She said, oh. I had to leave earlier because you dropped me off at the front door and now I got to park in the student parking lot. <laughs> and she said it was kind of lonely. There was no one to talk to. And I just laughed. I said, you didn't talk to me when I was with you in the car. Well, that's different. Yeah. So the mind of a 16 year old is just, anyway. Uh, so, you know, I go into work and I do work all day. I, I'm, I have meetings, uh, usually they're on the half hour. So I'm, yeah. my schedule's pretty full all day long. And I try and mentor a lot of young people. I'm chairman of several different boards, Boys and Girls Club. I just uh, relinquished the, the Fort Wayne Philharmonic Orchestra. I'm still mm. on our zoo board, uh, an organization called Love Fort Wayne. I'm, I'm just uh, still on, but just gave up the board chairmanship. Um, uh, lots of meetings all day, just meeting yeah. with people, inspiring folks. Uh, and then with the foundation, we're giving lots of money away. So mm. we're trying to talk to folks to understand how they would use it effectively and yeah. make sure it's not being wasted and that sort of thing. Certainly. Um, I work pretty hard from 8 o'clock. And I say, what I would say is a little different since Sweetwater is I try and get out of there at 5 o'clock or so. Yeah. So I'm home most evenings where before I would have to meet manufacturers in the evening and that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, but I'm still really active. You know, I'm on the search committee for our church to find a new pastor. Mm. Uh, he was one of the casualties, like many pastors over COVID, where, uh, you know, they were uh, mentoring to their flock and, and, and pastoring their flock, but nobody was really pastoring to them. So mm. he got to a point where he was just really stressed and resigned last mm. May. So we're trying to find a replacement for him. I play music in three different bands, so that keeps me pretty busy. And yeah. A lot of stuff. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into kind of this final question is, how do you manage life, family, like work balance? You're so busy and I mean, starting out, I'm sure it's slowing down or evening out a little bit, but how do you manage that? Sure, uh, you know, I've been asked that question a lot through the years and what I would say is, if I'm in, I'm all in. So when I'm working, I'm working really hard. When I'm playing, I'm playing real hard. I'm flying helicopters, I'm in my boats, I'm doing all crazy stuff. Uh, when I'm with my family, I'm all in. And you know, my phone is in my pocket. I'm not distracted with phone calls and that sort of thing when it's family time. And so just whatever I'm doing, I wanna be completely present and all in. And uh, it, it allows me to have that balance that you're talking about. Mm. I'm not distracted with phone calls and yeah. interruptions with email and that sort of thing. Amazing. Well, Chuck, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to get into Cameron Smith's interview and then prepare some questions. We're going to do uh, a full Q&A uh, with the panel directly following that. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.